What is people-centric digital marketing and why does it matter? With Neil Schaefer. The Strategic Marketing Show is brought to you by Insights for Professionals, providing access to the latest industry insights from trusted brands, all in a customized, tailored experience. Find out more over at insightsforprofessionals.com. Hey, it's David. Is people-centric digital marketing just a buzzword, or can it actually play a key, measurable part in your marketing activities? That's what we're going to be covering today with a man who's a university instructor at Rutgers Business School and UCLA Extension, the author of The Age of Influence, The Definitive Guide, Redefining Influence or Marketing. And if that's not enough, he's also a fractional CMO. A warm welcome to the Strategic Marketing Show, Neil Schaefer. David, thank you so much for having me. I am I'm quite honored to be here. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Neil. Well, you can find Neil over at neilshafer.com. So, Neil, what is people-centric digital marketing and why does it matter? Yeah, you know, I, I just, we were just talking, I just came back from a B2B marketing event in London. And I just want to share with you my, my summary of that before we go into the story, because I think it will really add, add a little bit of flavor and context. So... Uh, this one-day event, uh, talking about a lot of things that I'm going to talk about today, reminded me that B2B marketing is about relationships and not followers. It's about collaboration and not ego. It's about truly making organizational and societal change and not chasing after the next trend. I believe for B2B marketing to mature, it requires this people-centric approach and when we talk about people-centric, we talk about the things we're going to talk about today, employee advocacy, influencer marketing, from a B2B perspective, employer branding, brand advocacy. These are things we've talked about for the last decade. I think there's a lot of companies that have tried them uh, to various successes, but if we put them all together into just thinking more in terms of people and relationships, the relationships we have with them, the relationships that they have with social media, I think we begin to uncover some truths because the world we live in today is very different than what we lived in 10 years ago when a lot of companies created their first digital marketing, social media marketing strategy, or their first digital marketing strategy that includes social media marketing. We've come quite far since then. And we have to remember that when we began this journey, uh, we ourselves were only social media users for a year or two. Now we have uh, you know, millennials that have used it throughout their entire working life. Uh, and, and therefore, they use it more deeply, more intensely. And I think that if we do not understand that, and we sort of think of social media as being 10 years ago, uh, and we still do marketing the same way, we miss out on these people-centric marketing opportunities. So to define it, it you know, the people that I talk about here are number one, employees, Number two, you know, partners, distributors that often uh, in in uh, in B two B ecosystems, uh, also your customers, also what we would call external influencers. If we call employees internal influencers, there are external influencers. Those are those people that you see at these tech events uh, that don't work for the tech company yet get invited to speak. Uh, interesting case in point, there's a gentleman, maybe you've heard of him in London called Mr. Bingo. Mr. Bingo is an illustrator artist who got invited by Adobe to speak at their recent Adobe Max presentation in Los Angeles. I love Mr. Bingo's presentation. I met him at his studio in London and bought some of his art, and I will be sharing about that on my social media. Mr. Bingo is not an Adobe customer per se, but he does have influence in the world of, of art uh, and, and has quite a lot of fans. So I think that's a great uh, example um, of how you know we, we sometimes think in the B2B perspective of influencers as being, why would we want to pay irrelevant people that have lots of followers? But it's not that at all. These are really in terms of uh, influence with B2B, we're talking about subject matter experts. Some of them are internal and we want to bring their voice out, right? Because this is what offline, these are the people that our clients want to see. These are the people that are speaking at the events. How do we bring them more into the digital world? And then who are those people that are already subject matter experts that are speaking about our type of, uh, of industry that already have a big community? These are the external influencers. So when you think in terms of people, 
instead of in terms of social network or content type, and you do realize this value of relationships, I believe whether it's internally, externally, I believe that really is the key. And I know, David, I don't want to jump too much into the subject, but I did mention, you know, when we talk about employees, internal influencers, we have employee advocacy, external influencers, we have uh, influencer marketing, uh, brand advocacy, we could also consider them influential. Uh, these are more external influencers because they're not our clients yet. Uh, and then we have the others. We have the employer branding. These are the people that decide whether or not they want to join your company based on your social media, based on your digital reputation, for lack of a better word. The stats are incredible about the number of people that use social media to find a job to vet employers. And the best way for brands to have a better employer brand is to get their employees out there uh, as their word of mouth, uh, you know, advocate army, uh, which really taps into this employee advocacy. Uh, so to me, the, these things are all aligned under the term people centric marketing. I, you know, I don't know if it's a term that a lot of people use, but I think if we invest in people and those relationships instead of the Zuckerbergs and those external factors that we have no control over, these are all people we do. We don't have control over them, but we can invest in those relationships and we know we can deepen them. Uh, I believe that it's it's going to be in the long run, potentially a very much smarter and more impactful uh, way to invest our precious marketing budget. I think it all makes incredible intuitive sense to most marketers to say that build better relationships and focus on people. And that was a wonderful intro introduction you gave. And we'll uh, dive slightly deeper into those four key areas that you highlighted as well. But um, just before we do that, you talked about the value of relationships. Uh, can you actually define the financial value of relationships? Or is that more of something that you have to trust your gut to realize that there is that value that will happen in the future? Well, as with marketing, if you want to measure anything and everything you could, the funny thing about marketers is often they have these double standards where they're not measuring the success of their print ads or TV ads, yet they require excessive uh, micromanaging of digital campaigns because it is trackable. Uh, and that's, the, you know, one of the, the beautiful things is in terms of digital activity, this is trackable. With working with external influencers, you'll find that if they are true fans of your brand, uh, even though you might have some sort of contractual commitment for a speaking engagement or uh, a piece of content or whatever it might be, that they will often speak about you when they're not required to. It's because they're a true advocate of your brand. They truly love your brand and they become a natural uh, speaker, naturally sharing information and, and talking about you on social, what have you. And that is an example of something where, yes, you could measure how many times they mention your brand and you could put a number uh, based on the number of impressions that you might get coming from their account versus a digital marketing campaign. So I think this is all measurable. I mean, there are things like net promoter score. What's the ROI of a high net promoter score? Intuitively, we know that it is extremely important, but how do you put a monetary value on that? And I think in terms of employee advocacy, that is uh, obviously one clear metric, but another one are just pieces of content, right? How many of our employees are talking about us in social, which is not only a great indicator of positive net promoter score, but also every time our, our brand is talked about, there is inherent value. Uh, and we can replace that with, well, if we had to advertise for this, how much would it cost? Obviously, when word of mouth comes from a person and not from an advertisement, it is more authentic, it is more relatable, uh, and uh, ultimately it will have better impact than that advertisement that is on today and off tomorrow. So I think that if we want to measure these things, we have the ability to. I think it's very much like, why should we invest in a LinkedIn channel, in a Facebook channel, uh, in a Twitter channel? And we can measure these things by how many engagements did we get? How big is our community growing? Uh, how many website visits did we get? How many leads did we generate? How many sales? But on the other hand, it's something that we know intuitively we have to do. And I think everything I've talked about here, David, are some companies are already doing some, if not all of it. But at some point, it, we have to get to that intuitive stage that we have to do it. How much ROI from, we get from it, we have to obviously pursue excellence in our marketing and in ROI. But you, these are things that really, I believe, you cannot ignore uh, today. And if you are not doing them, surely your savvy, innovative competitor or the startups 
where they don't have this legacy of traditional marketing to deal with, they're going to be a lot quicker. And I do think that your brand will be left out of the conversation, uh, literally and figuratively uh, going forward in the place where people spend most of their time, which today is social media. When you're talking about ROI, sometimes an easier way to actually measure the impact is actually to look at what you're doing that is actually potentially negative, what's having a negative impact. Because you can see when visitors leave your website, when people don't engage with you or don't buy from you at all. Um, so maybe looking at employer branding, um, can you think of an example of something that businesses are doing at the moment that are actually having a negative impact on their target audience? Well, I think the biggest negative impact is just not being in control of the narrative. We cannot control our brand in social media. Everybody will have their own perception of it. But there are things we can do to try to showcase the positives. And number one, obviously, is to somehow have your employees talking about how great of a place your brand is to, to work at. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, obviously, the, the savvy high-tech companies are always first to market with these things. So if you go to Instagram, you go to accounts like Life at IBM, uh, Life at Google, uh, Microsoft Life. Uh, I, I forget the exact uh, handles of these channels, but these are brands that have channels dedicated to the stories of their employees. The, the, the posts are the employees talking. Uh, there are things you can do with your LinkedIn company page to include uh, this sort of uh, branded, uh, employer branded approach. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think it comes down to take yourself out of your company. If you were to search up information about your company online, in social, what would you find? Obviously, there are sites like Glassdoor uh, and what have you, but I've always been a fan of if there's negative things about you online, you need to flood them out with a, a ton of positive things uh, from the people that know, like, and trust your brand. So I think the negative impact, for instance, of not having a positive employer brand is you don't attract good candidates. Often these candidates are trying to decide between you and someone else. They will go to the other company, uh, even if there's a similar salary involved. Uh, you'll also find that you retain people a lot. The retention is worse, for lack of a better word. They stay at your company uh, less time. In fact, the ones you want to stay longer stay lesser because you know people always want to grow. They want to more and more uh, work for a brand that is aligned with their values. And I think a lot of this comes into this, this company culture. And this is the, the, the opportunity of really investing in this employer brand is to rediscover your company culture and talk about it with your employees and make sure that everybody is aligned on the mission. And with that, I think will become a very, very powerful employee brand where your employees are more tied into the culture, the mission, and they're talking about it more and you will attract others with similar values. I think that that's one of these things, David, we talked beforehand about sort of what's the future. Uh, we know more and more that people want to buy from companies that they have uh, aligned values with. And obviously, they want to work for companies they have aligned values with as well. In fact, uh, David, I was uh, in London at this uh, influencer marketing event, and we had a number of B2B influencers on a panel. And we asked them, what is the number one most important thing when you consider working with businesses from an influencer, external influencer perspective? And they all agreed the number one thing was really brand value value alignment. So it begins with employer branding, but it really digs into the culture of who you are as a brand, as a company, what is your mission, and really getting everybody on board that. Sometimes maybe reshaping that culture in this age where we're talking about sustainability, uh, inclusiveness, uh, future of work. There's all these concepts that are floating out there. Maybe it's time to sort of revise what those missions are uh, now that we are in the 2020s. But I think even me just talking about this, I think hints at if you were to invest in this type of employer branding exercise, these are the conversations that it brings out. And I think it's a very healthy thing for any organization, which really is a, a, a living, breathing entity uh, that has to evolve with the times. And from an employee advocacy perspective, um, you gave great examples of progressive firms that have life at type social media accounts or blogs where perhaps potential employees can go in there and just get a feel for what the organization organization's about. But from a customer perspective, sometimes it's also perhaps even more effective to have a look to see what employees are saying about the company they work at on their own social media accounts, on things like Twitter and LinkedIn. Is that something that a brand should also be encouraging? And if so, how should they go about doing that? Yeah, so I like to tie all these into what I call 
influencer marketing. So I talked about the external influencers. When we talk about the internal influencers, there's a few different ways of looking at it. But in between, we have our customers. This is the brand advocacy part. So imagine if customers were to go to your blog and read case studies of how other companies are leveraging the company's technology that they're considering purchasing. That is a very, very powerful thing. This is why often in B2B that customers really are influencers. They, you know, I, I, I was, my background before uh, digital and social was B2B sales and biz dev. And the, the credibility and social proof that goes with every customer that you can say is your customer is huge. When these customers now in a human and relatable way talk about how they're using your technology, what type of a company you are to work with in terms of a blog, in terms of a YouTube interview, maybe speaking at a conference, maybe a webinar. These are obviously uh, huge uh, types of influencer marketing. When we get to the employees, yes, including your employees in your content as well. Having a dedicated channel is great, but it can also be included in one organic channel that you have or on your blog. It's always going to be a positive thing. But when your employees can truly talk about your company on their personal social media profiles. Now, not everybody says they work at a company on their profile with the exception of maybe LinkedIn. But even if you're at a company event and you you post it on your Instagram, people will, will you know, the, this, this social media branding, they will associate your brand with that person's experience with your brand. In this case, it is an employee at an event. So I often, David, uh, very, very recently get asked to speak to B2B often sales teams and just, it's not about publish more content about our company. It's more about just be more active on social media, right? And I will always say, yes, uh, they, they obviously should, ideally, if it resonates with them, post more about their company, but they should also talk more about their own personal passions and their own personal interests. So uh, inevitably, when we talk about employee advocacy, we also talk about personal branding. But if you can encourage the personal branding of your, inf- of your employees, you now begin to build this army of nano influencers with various passions uh, that are also talking about your company. You can imagine how how powerful that is. Obviously, you can uh, leverage tools where if they talk about your company, it'll be a customized link, and therefore you'll be able to track the number of clicks and what have you. Um, But I don't even think you have to go that far to realize the potential impact that all of this can have. And on the employer branding side of things, I believe that you have a case study that you can share with us. Yeah, this is my favorite case. That I'd say that the two things that I get asked to talk about most, well, three things, influencer marketing, obviously, because I wrote The Age of Influence, um, this sort of social selling employee advocacy, uh, let's raise the social media uh, intelligence or IQ of our employees and and me being almost a cheerleader <laughs> for getting them more active to helping them see the benefits from personal branding perspective. The other one is employer branding. And it's funny because when social selling came around, we were all saying, you know, marketing is becoming more like sales and sales is becoming more like marketing with the advent of social media. And if you dig into employer branding, which is primarily obviously managed by HR, uh, they will say that HR is becoming more like marketing, more, uh, they have to market the company in order to attract employees. So a great example I give, and it, it's the one that has the most impact. And it just happened to be that I found this video when doing research for uh, a Japanese uh, client is actually a Japanese company. Now, uh, TikTok is less popular in Japan than it is here. In fact, social media in general is, is, is the average time spent on social media by the average person in Japan is much lower than it is in the UK or in the United States. So the impact is a lot less, but this company um, decided on TikTok and they're a very small business. They are a security company. I believe the name is Daikyo Security. Uh, and so they provide security services for you know building security or, or whatever it is that people that stand out there to in uniforms to help secure things. Uh, and when you uh, look at this video, which you can find on YouTube, or it actually came out of CNN Business, uh, you know, you see these these older people, uh, the executives that are in their 50s and 60s. Yes, there's a little bit of dancing. There's a little bit of entertainment. But basically, they're showcasing that they are a fun place to work at. And uh, they interview the CEO who says, yes, we'll have some of my subordinates mock me as part of what we do on TikTok. Almost like it's hard to believe that this is a Japanese company. It's hard to believe that this is a place that people can actually work at. And they were so successful with these videos that they were able to monetize the account with the ad revenue, hire an editor to be able to do more sophisticated videos. But most importantly, they say whenever they put out a video that goes viral, which happens quite often with their TikTok account, they will literally see more 
more inquiries. Do you have any job openings? This looks like a great place to work at. And that is the ultimate employer brand. If people look up this brand on social, they're inevitably going to find those TikTok videos. This is one case which they're able to control that narrative because they're not that big of a brand, right? Um, and they're going to see what looks like, you know, the, the executive team themselves look relatable, authentic, approachable. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that we can't say that for, right? Um, which is why in an employee advocacy program, you know, Ideally, we'd like to start with the executives. Interesting thing, though, in most companies, the people that we relate to and trust the most are just the average employee. So employee advocacy is not just about the salespeople at social selling. It's not just about the executives. It's not just about the subject matter experts. Is as you questioned before, what's the benefit of getting all the other employees on? Because they are the most trustworthy, relatable people, the most authentic people. And that is where you'll see this tremendous impact. But that's a very, very simple case study that when uh, I have shown it on recent occasion as part of my presentations, uh, together with everything else I'm talking about, it just has immediate impact. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll have to get you the link to put in the show notes for this. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I wonder if you're going to advise um, that um, the listener should incorporate what you've just said there as part of their future strategy. Maybe we'll find out in a second there by um, moving on to what works now um, to planning for the future. So in your opinion, what's the biggest marketing trend or challenge for marketers over the coming year? Yeah, I like to say, I really believe that we are in the middle of the changing of the guard. And this is not an uh, analogy because I just came back from London, um, but uh, it is the fact that, you know, we're coming out of COVID, certain trends have accelerated more than others. But I think just comparing to pre-COVID, the way that we create and consume content is very, very different than it was before. We are also getting younger, right? Uh, the average, well, the millennials are already, at least in the United States, a majority of our workforce. And uh, Gen Z, it said, in 2025 will be 25% of our workforce. And these are digital native generations, whereas most leaders of, of big enterprises are not from those generations. Uh, and I think also with continuing labor shortages, not in every economy, certainly here in the United States, this tight labor market is continuing. And when you think of a tight labor market combined with people that have expertise in digital marketing, in influencer marketing, employee advocacy, the numbers just dwindled to be fewer and fewer. So I think that this is going to challenge a lot of companies, this one-way type of advertising that most marketers feel very comfortable with traditionally, you know, people more and more can read through ads. I've posted stuff myself on Instagram of just products I love, just because I, I feel good about them. They didn't pay me to do it, but inevitably I'll have people say, Neil, is that an ad? Did someone pay you to say that? That is how far, and these are, you know, Gen Xers and boomers saying this to me, not the Gen Z and the millennials. So we've come to a place where social media has only become, I mean, my kids are on social media probably for an hour before they even go to school, right? On their Instagram, on their TikTok. These are high school kids. But we've gotten to this point where people really crave the raw and authentic. I think that COVID definitely influenced and affected this, but it, it's the raw, the authentic, the relatable. Is it aligned with my brand values? These are all things that more and more uh, large companies have to put into consideration in how they engage with people. Uh, obviously, digitally, how they engage with people, but also how they engage with their employees. That's why, even though employer branding is not a marketing specific topic, it really is this HR topic. I think it blends really, really well together because it affects marketing as well in terms of the younger, you know, even if you're targeting B2B executives, well, more B2B executives are becoming millennials, right? Uh, especially for startup companies. So it, it's a conversation I think we can't ignore. I think it challenges our way of thinking. Social media already required marketers to think very differently. I think this is a, a new iteration, a very, very important iteration. And I think that, you know, how can we create short form videos around these B2B topics? How can we resonate more with our audiences, resonate more with our employees? I think if we begin to uncover how do we, what are our brand values? How do we align them with our employees, with uh, our, our constituents? If, if we begin to think about these things now, we don't have to go out there and, and, you know, a year from now, we're going to have a million followers on TikTok. That's not, it's not about chasing the trend, but it is about having a collaborative exercise internally 
to take a deep dive into these questions and begin to create your own thoughts around them, your own strategies, your own implementations for this changing of the guard, changing of the generation and everything that comes with it, uh, I think is going to be critical. Uh, and I think that uh, those brands that that get this and start doing it earlier, um, you know, the Daikyo Securities is one example. Duolingo, I mean, they're a public company now. Uh, if you go to Duolingo on TikTok, you'll find a number of videos uh, that are just of their employees. Yes, they also have a mascot, which is all cute and funny, but it's also their employees in, in their work environment. Uh, and these things are extremely relatable. And it's it's a brand that's well-known by uh, this new generation. It might be as well-known as some very, very famous brands because they've done so well on TikTok. So just a few things to think about as we go forward here. I, you know, Every year we try to uh, shake things up, but I do believe coming out of COVID and just seeing these different trends in the demographics it's really going to require us to do another, I'm not going to say a reset, but just rethink and enhance the value that all of our companies have, um, but just find new ways of expressing it through more people, more brand values, and more creativity when it comes to the content. Certainly, a few things to think about there. I've been your host, David Bain. You can find Neil over at neilshafer.com. Neil, thanks so much for being on the Strategic Marketing Show. It's been an honor. And thank you for listening. Here at IFP, our goal is simple, to connect you with the most relevant information to help solve your business problems all in one place. InsightsForProfessionals.com